Reverend Mary on the topic of aliveness. Good morning. You know, Reverend Sue is at the women's retreat with about 40 women, so I'm sure they're having a most wonderful time being alive on a ranch in the country. I, it's just got to be a wonderful experience. But she assigned our talk, and she assigned the book of the month, and it's by Brother David Randall Stendhal Rast. And it was the first chapter, and unbeknownst, I'm sure, to Sue, <laughs> but shockingly to me, it was really the introduction, and it was only two pages long, my whole talk. It was only two pages long in the book. So all week, I had to pull books off my shelf. Aliveness. Is that book about aliveness? Is that book about aliveness? And I read, and I read, and I read. And you know what I found? Is that made me feel alive, the research. Just the research. Yeah, what are they saying about aliveness? What are they saying? Well, you know, this is pretty depressing. Well, this is pretty exciting. But where's the aliveness in all these books that I have? Hundreds of them, Paul knows. <laughs> but Brother David Stendhal Ross said, and this is the best of the two pages, the fact that you're not dead yet is not sufficient proof that you're alive. <laughs> I thought, that says it all, doesn't it? The fact that you're not dead yet is not sufficient proof that you're alive. He invites us to wake up. So I pulled the book from Kabir off my uh, bookshelf, and he says, you know, if you have a body, don't just sit on your porch. Go walking in the rain. And what he means is get out there. Be alive. Be part of what's happening. That's what aliveness is, just walking in the rain. I mean, doesn't that feel good when it's, of course, not stormy, but just a nice northwest sprinkle, and you're out there getting your exercise in the rain? That's when you feel alive, doing those special things. So both of these wise men were talking to us about to, ways to stop being lazy. Now, they're kind of in your face about it, but there's a lot of ways that we can stop being lazy and be alive in this world. You know, walking can be taken for granted. And believe me, as I get older, I don't take it for granted anymore. I see a lot of people in our neighborhood who used to walk that don't walk anymore and see the difficulties for some as they get older just with walking. And, you know, walking is very precious. But I now feel that preciousness when I can be out around our lake in the morning and I'm hearing the birds sing and feel the sun. And, and I feel alive because I can walk and be out there and do that. And, and then there's those moments when there's a storm that goes by and I see a rainbow. Don't you act surprised every time you see a rainbow? It's like we didn't expect it. We don't know how long it's going to last. But it's so beautiful. Everything in your world just wants to stop and look. I saw one some months ago, and I even wanted to pull off the highway to watch it because it was an end-to-end -end rainbow, and I thought, that is precious. It's there in some shape or form in the clouds, but with the right angle, with the right view, with the right attitude, I could enjoy every single short moment of the life of a rainbow in my life. So what I started seeing is that, you know, even when I see a rose in the spring, the first bloom of roses, they're always so wonderful, and they smell so good. And then there's that little rosebud in December when it starts to get really cold and nasty, and it's trying to bloom. Do you know that? And you're just edging it, you're just egging it on, hoping if you could bring it in, it'll get to blossom like it, like it wants to. So this is all about aliveness in us, just paying attention paying attention to what's around us. And you know, if we really understood how the whole universe worked, we would be in awe. We would feel so alive to just be in this precious human body every moment. It's just so special. In the science of mind philosophy, we really encourage you to continually stretch beyond where you are, continually. Because that is the evolution of the universe. The, the universe continues to evolve, to expand, and we're part of that. We were created as part of that. So when we kind of get a little lazy, um, we get our comeuppance in one way or another. The body just doesn't want to function as well because we're not letting it, the aliveness in it, fully participate in the world. 
So what happens when we stretch? We become more flexible. We become more cheerful because some of those aches and pains go away. And yes, it does take courage. It takes courage to go through those first few stretches where yeah, maybe the next day it hurts a little bit. But then you can stretch a little farther and a little farther and a little farther. It's not only in our body, but it's in our mind that this stretching is very, very important. I pulled a book off my shelf this week by Pema Chodron. She's an author and a Buddhist nun. I just love her book. She's, she's just brilliant the way she talks about things. And the book is called No Time to Lose. And there is no time to lose. Her teacher was Trungpa Rinpoche, and he encouraged all his students to experiment with life. Experiment. Why? Because you have nothing to lose. And so when I see teenagers going this way or that way, and you're like, oh, oh my goodness, I think, okay, it's an experiment. It's not forever. And I can relax a little bit and see that, yeah, when I was a teenager, I probably experimented a little too. In various ways. I was strict Catholic, so I didn't experiment too far. <laughs> but I did read a book about Lutheran churches, so that was, you know, <laughs> it was funny. That was really risky back then, very risky. But like he said, if the wind isn't blowing, nothing's moving. And I, I've been reading this book, Breakout, by Joel Osteen this week, a mega church guy on TV. Now, he still believes God's out there, and, but one of the things he said is God is breathing on you right now. And I really felt that. And that's what happens when we feel alive. When we feel this tingle, I can feel it right now. But to think that God's breathing on me, how special is that? Now, we would say that's happening all the time. You're just more aware of it at one moment than another. But the breath of God is just a great visual. If you're that special, it's time to stretch. It's, try, it's time to be more than you were yesterday. And that's the beauty of this teaching. We encourage that. And especially in classes, that's where you learn to stretch even more. So the Rinpoche talks about laziness, and I love this. He says there's three kinds of laziness. Laziness, number one, not being willing to make an effort. In other words, being too comfortable. Anyone here like to be comfortable? I love to be comfortable. Ask Paul. I hate being cold. Sometimes I'm cold, and sometimes it's okay, and sometimes it's not. But when you get too comfortable, you're missing out on a whole part of life. You'd be missing out of being in our office during the week when Lori and Sylvia have it at 68 degrees. I'm not going to miss that. No. <laughs> but, but it's... It's flowing with life. It's being with life. Because sometimes life offers us things that are unpleasant that we have to do. Colonoscopy. <laughs> Unpleasantness. But it's part of life. It's part of the health of life. So he talks about if you're too comfortable, this is not where you want to be on the spiritual path. When I was young, some of my neighbors uh, went to Paris and London, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's the most wonderful thing in the world. But then they would stay in a holiday inn. <laughs> Comfort. Predictability. I was like, you're going to Europe? Because we had a holiday inn, and, and you're going to stay in a holiday inn, just like here in little old Springfield, Ohio? What are you doing? But we do that, don't we? We want to be comfortable. We want to know for sure the food's going to be okay, the bed's going to be okay, and and we're not going to have a lot of weird things going on and unpredictable things that would take us out of our comfort zone. So that's the problem with being comfortable. We get so comfortable, we assume our dreams aren't going to come true. Oh, bad assumption in this church. We assume that it's okay that I don't have a person that loves me. Oh, don't get comfortable with that. So getting comfortable is an issue that stops us from moving forward. Here we're asking you to move forward. And sometimes it's scary. But you know what, it's Halloween, so it's, it's okay. <laughs> we had a lot of scary goblins at our house. Oh my gosh, amazing costumes. So I challenge you to sign up for the next round of classes. Get that mind moving. Get off this comfortable feeling that you really are totally embodying this teaching, because I'm not. 
Every day I find ways in places that I'm not, and I strive to do better tomorrow. That keeps me alive. The challenge, the challenge. So when we lose our enthusiasm about life, we don't think we can overcome the past. Are we going to accomplish our dreams? Are we going to get stuck where we are? Well, I'll tell you what, if you think you're going to get stuck where you are, your body's not going to be stuck. I mean, if you're over 60, you're on that, you know, slope. You're on that slope. And the body's going to tell you where you're stuck. So we don't want you to be stuck. We want you to live every moment in pure health and excitement and aliveness for being here. I remembered when I went uh, to college, I worked so hard for my grades. I stressed myself out so much. And when I read Joel Osteen's book this week, he was, he was talking about this university professor and it was the end of the year and he was giving his students the most important test of the year. And he said to them, anybody who would like a C, raise your hand and you'll get a C and you can leave right now. And one by one, the hands went up till about half the class, their hands went up. And he goes, okay, you guys get a C. I'm writing your names down, you can leave. And they were so relieved. Can you imagine if you're not ready for a finals test and somebody offers you a C in a class you didn't really like, chemistry? <laughs> If I could get a C that easy, it would have been wonderful. Then all the rest of the students, he gave him a little pep talk. He said, you know, when you strive for the best, unexpected, incredible things are going to happen for you. When you strive to always do the best. So he handed out the papers, and the students, he said, don't turn it over yet. And when he told him to turn it over, at the top of the paper, it said, congratulations, you've just made an A. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I love that story. I love that story. So the people that were satisfied with a C went on to be Cs. And the ones that thought, I'm going to give it my best, got an A. So too many times when we feel comfortable, we're taking a C grade in life. I invite you to think about that. We settle for a C. God has an A for us. God has an A for us. In this teaching, it's an A-grade teaching. It's awesome. But we have to want it, don't we? We have to want it. Because it's going to take doing your spiritual practices to get an A in this philosophy. That's an old one, isn't it? Do your spiritual practices. But that's how we're going to raise our life experience from a C experience to an A experience. I saw this cartoon, it was called Reasons Not to Meditate. The first drawing was a little baby in a crib and it said, too young. And the next box were students and parents and people at work and it said, too busy. And the next box was an elder, older, elderly <laughs> person, it says, too old. And the next box was a corpse and it said, too late too late. There will be that moment. So are we going for an A life or what? Being truly alive means stretching our comfort zone. You know, A's are worth working for. I've told you before, when I went to college, I was determined to get a 3.0 average. And I worked my tail off and I laughed later when I got a 3.01. Because that was what I was striving for. And I knew it was going to be hard, and it was. Of course, that's the truth, right? Whatever we assume is going to be, it's going to show up that way. So what I realized from this teaching, if you have only good enough, you're not pushing the envelope, the envelope of what God is expecting of all his beautiful creation to continue to evolve on this evolutionary spiral. So the Rinpoche says the second <coughs> kind of laziness is caused loss, called loss of heart, where we try and try and try and never seem to get it right. Ever had one of those times? I've tried this and tried this, and I can't seem to get it right. And we just kind of give up. We get lazy, and we're so lazy, we aren't even helping ourselves, let alone trying to get something else right. Maybe it's at work or something. So we distract ourselves with trivial things. 
oh, I have to be on the internet three hours today. At least I can get that right. <laughs> Tell my computer that yesterday. Called nerds on call and they didn't call me back. So, you know, it was a trivial pursuit. I was writing this talk in the middle of it and it was like, oh dear, stay calm, you know, treat for the computer, a little finagling, I got it going again and I'm gonna call them today and remind them they didn't call me back yesterday, but my talk turned out okay. So it was, it was the trivial thing, probably to them, somebody's computer was on the blink, but it isn't trivial. But yet we, I can spend a lot of hours on trivial things because the other things are a little too hard and I don't seem to get them right. When we get caught up in trivial things, we actually increase our level of depression about the world. And there's a lot going on out there. And the truth is that here's where spirit meets us, at the level of our faith. This is how treatment works, spiritual mind treatment, affirmative prayer. At the level of our faith, not God's faith, God has full faith and confidence in us, but it's at the level of our faith. In the Bible, James 4, um, second phrase in the Bible, it says, you have not because you ask not. You really, you have not because you ask not. That's pretty science of mind. That's pretty principle. So if you're not asking big, hmm, what kind of aliveness is there? What kind of laziness is there that you're not asking for big, better, more, different? It's part of our human nature. Now we know when we get too caught up in the outer, things start to happen. But what about the inner? Asking bigger awareness a bigger ability to stand calm in a storm, a bigger ability when the wind blows and things are swirling all around us that we can, we can be centered in our knowing of who we are. You know, God created the whole universe and, and he created each one of us to experience that, to find our way through that. Recently, I met with someone who was having eye problems and I was thinking about all this. Am I going to do an A treatment or a C treatment? And am I going to think big enough for this person? Am I going to know big enough for this person? And so I wrote what I call a, a God-sized prayer. And I want to share a little of it with you because it's a whole page long, really got into it. But I thought you might see a little bit of what I mean by a God-sized prayer. Looking at this seeming problem with the eyes from God's point of view. From this moment forward, I know that she pays greater attention to herself as an individual creation of God. I focus on the health of her eyes, which were created by God to enjoy the beauty of the earth, the flowers, the plants, the sun, and the clouds. As she fills her mind with beauty, her body feels enlivened, refreshed, and her eyes return to perfect health. She feels lighter, full of satisfaction, energetic and clear. With her body alive and healthy, I know her mind is clear and sharp, enabling her to see a greater plan, the greater good God has available for her right now. That leads to a greater beauty flowing in her life. As she takes the helm of her life, with perfect sight, she now steers clearly through all the currents, delighting in the waves and the wildlife. God charts the course and she still steers with courageous abandon. That's what I mean by a God-sized prayer. If you haven't had one of those prayed for you recently, do tap one of our practitioners after service and say, I want one of those. I want one of those that makes me feel alive and connected to the, the whole universe, that makes me feel connected to God, to see the perfection really unfolding in my life today. So the Rinpoche's third reason for laziness, third kind of laziness, is I really could care less. Do you ever hear that from people? I, I really could care less. I don't watch the news because I really could care less. And it really is a, a sense of contempt for what's happening. It kind of takes the wind out of your sails when someone doesn't care about life and about this world. 
because it's our fundamental nature to be curious. Do you ever see a little child just say, I couldn't care less about walking or crawling? <laughs> couldn't care less about walking or talking? No, they're curious. That's our nature. That's how we came into this world. So it's time to also check in with your moods. If you have one of those moods that I couldn't care less, just check in with that. What are you avoiding? How lazy is that? It may not be lazy for that issue, but it might be for another one. So Pema Chodron has a lot of good ideas. Why not try and be enthusiastic? Why not give it a try? Just give it a try. I worked with a person years ago at Crown Zellerback who was so enthusiastic he was bouncing off the walls. He never worked, and I had to work on teams with him. It irritated the heck out of me. But he was enthusiastic. He was a cheerleader. Rah, rah. And I, I said, but you're not doing your work. He goes, nobody ever gets fired for being enthusiastic. I thought, ah. <laughs> I didn't like that. I'm sure he's still there because he made people feel good. <clears throat> Enthusiasm is awesome. On Monday night, I went down to Chico because the pastor of the Greater Chico Church died like that. Just fell over it, and that was it. Let us all be so lucky. But it was a shock to everyone, a shock to his congregation and everyone who loved him because Louis Gates was enthusiasm personified. I mean, he was out there. You cannot be in a room with him without feeling his energy. He and his partner, Michael, had a beautician, beauty shop in Chico for 34 years. And when you walked in there, you felt his energy. It was beautiful, big statues, big flowers, because life for him was big. And he would always schedule an extra half hour for your, your time with him because he wanted to check in with you. How's it going? How can I help? What are you up to? He was just so enthusiastic. Reverend Carolyn talked about going on vacation with him, and she says it's really difficult because he just disappears and goes off meeting people. And he comes back an hour later, and he'll say, you won't believe the person I met who was raised in Kansas, had a horse, blah, 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 had moved in. He knew their whole life in a half hour. Standing in the bank line, he would get to know you, and you'd think he, were, he was your best friend. He just lived life at that level. And he will be greatly missed. They expected 300 people at the service, and 800 people came. It's so beautiful. He just changed everyone's life by being enthusiastic, very enthusiastic. We have a lot to learn from, from our good friend Louis. He will be missed. So think about it this week. What is drowning your enthusiasm? Step back and take a new look. Are you really seeing it from God's eyes? what you think is so overwhelming or what you think is such a problem. From God's eyes, is it really? We were made with enthusiasm. So one way to increase our aliveness is taming our mind. Don't we get carried away? Oh my gosh, the sky is falling. Even in the 20s, people were saying the sky is falling. And today they're saying, no, it's really falling. It's really, really falling now. Not from God's eyes. You know, I, I listen to the news. It drives Paul a little crazy, but I do. I like to know what's going on in the world. Not to be pent up on fear or worry, but I really have a fascination with how people get out of problems or create problems. <laughs> how they get out of problems. Because based on the news and everything that's happening, Public opinion just goes up and down and all over the place, and, and you don't know how it's going to come out. It's quite fascinating to watch. I've always been that way. My Aunt Agnes taught me that. Always pay attention to what's going on in the world. Emma Curtis Hopkins had it right, and I always go back to her belief. Everyone is always doing what's in their best interest at every moment, no matter how bad it looks no matter how outrageous it looks, no matter how crazy it looks. We're all doing the best we can with what we have at the moment. So as I watch news reports or listen to them on the radio or look at Fox News and the Wall Street Journal and CNN on my computer, I'm always looking at it from that perspective. Everybody's doing what they think is right. 
and they're not asking my opinion. So that must be true. <laughs> So the sky is not falling, and I trust the universe completely. Because if I can stay in the present moment and keep my mind tamed down, being the observer of all this, then I can flow with joy and aliveness. I can flow with surprise and awe, and like, I wouldn't have done it that way, but then I wouldn't have done it that way. So this is the thrill of being alive in life, paying attention, paying attention. One of the things Pema and Chodron learned from her teacher was to look for the gaps. And I thought, gaps, hmm, what could that be? And she said, every time we can take a breath, at the end of our out breath, there's a gap. So do that with me, just to recognize it really is happening. In breath, out breath, gap. There's a little gap. She said, in those gaps, Poke holes in the clouds in your life. Poke a hole in the cloud in your life. Just know that it's not true. Poke a hole in it. Take that moment to see what I'm thinking I'm seeing when my mind's going crazy is not the truth. I learned this from chaplain training, and I was glad to hear her talk about this because when I would be with someone who <clears throat> died and then their family came, the first 10 sentences I said out of my mouth, they would repeat to each other throughout the family because they were in shock. And so what I would do is I'd take a breath. <sighs> what really happened here? What's really going on here? And give a message of love that they could give to everyone else in their family. So I was poking a hole in the cloud, so to speak. And I like that visualization. When we're shocked about something, Take that breath and take that moment and go, what's really going on here? Poke a hole in what looks like a cloud. Tame the mind. When we tame the mind, the body slows down. The body enjoys that, that pause so that we don't take ourselves into chaos. We know this works. And as a minister and all our practitioners, we know it works. But you know what? We fall off the wagon too. But what we do is we start laughing. We just start laughing because we're all human. And so when I invite you to see a minister or practitioner and ask for that treatment that just makes you feel alive, that shoves you in that direction of full aliveness, full enthusiasm for life, know that it's true. This is how we do it. This is how it works. It's inborn wisdom that we had as we came into this world as a child that didn't decide to quit walking or talking, although Louis did. His parents said Louis didn't talk till he was three, and then we couldn't shut him up. He was observing the world, and then he let it all come forth. So he's a good role model for me. So I'm inviting you to get radical today. Just get radical. Do something you hadn't planned to do. Buy some ice cream. Take a walk in nature. Do something that you hadn't planned to do and see if that doesn't make you feel more alive today. And from that aliveness feeling, then you can make much better decisions. You can see that the clouds in your life are really just illusionary. They're there, but they're not the truth of you. Not the truth of you. So I want to close with this cute little thing in the... Uh, Living the Science of Mind, it, I thought it was just made me laugh. Let the howlers howl, and the growlers growl, and the scowlers scowl, and let the rough go to it. Because just behind the night, there is plenty of light, and the world is all right, and I know it. And there you are. Aliveness, aliveness, what does that mean to you? Do you remember a moment when you were truly, truly alive, when every cell in your body was just sparkling? That moment of sparkle, you know that feeling? Aliveness. We're not always there, are we? But sometimes we get there. I know there are 40 women in this church that are at a retreat this weekend, 
on a ranch out in the country by Shasta Lake, and I know they're feeling very alive. So I, I'm anxious to hear the stories when they come back and see what a wonderful experience that was. Reverend Sue's leading that, and before she went on this retreat, she said, here's the book for your talk, and your talk is on the first chapter, Aliveness. And she didn't know that that was really the introduction, and it was only two pages long. <laughs> so all week, I was scrambling. Aliveness, what is it? Well, you, you have to feel it, but how am I going to talk about it? So I'm pulling all these books off my bookshelves at home and going, that's not going to make people feel alive. Well, that's kind of boring. Well, you know, how am I going to make this happen? And it, it's, it's come together pretty well. Um, but really, in those two pages of, the, of that book, Brother David Stendhal Rost, he says this, the fact that you're not dead yet is not sufficient proof that you're alive. <laughs> so what a great way to start out the talk. Just because you're not dead is no proof that you're really alive. And we get into that little funk every now and then. And then I got a book from Kabir and he said, if you have a body, don't sit on the porch with it, go out and walk in the rain. You know when you're walking in the rain, it's not a heavy rain, it's a northwest misty rain and, and you're just smelling the air and feeling the rain. It's really a great moment to, to just feel alive. But what both these wise men are saying is, quit being so lazy. Quit being lazy. Ooh, I don't like that word. You wouldn't catch me being lazy, actually. There's always another book to read. Even though it looks like I might be being lazy, my brain is going in a thousand different directions. Another thing that we don't take for granted, and, and he reminded me of this, is rainbows. Do you know when you see a rainbow, you just want to stop and look at it? I almost pulled off the highway a few months ago. It was just one of those end-to-end -end rainbows, and it was so vibrant. And I thought, oh, I, I can't not look at this. And just looking at the rainbow made me feel alive. Because it was just a little gift. It's there, and then it's not there. And what I realized, it made me feel grateful. Grateful for a storm that ended up with such a beautiful rainbow. So we have all these senses, our eyes to see a beautiful rainbow. And then remember in the spring, the first uh, roses that come out, they're all so beautiful and they're lush and they're big and they're smelly and they're just wonderful and you want to smell every one. That's an aliveness feeling when we just welcome the spring and welcome the roses and and then I always get a kick out of it in December when there's this little rosebud and he thinks he's gonna bloom and he gets frozen and I just think oh I gotta bring him in the house you know let him do his thing and let him be alive in his fullness and it doesn't always work but I just give him a lot of credit I give him a lot of credit for trying even if it's freezing out so in this Science of Mind philosophy, we're continually inviting you to stretch. And when it comes to aliveness, we're inviting you to stretch into seeing a greater world, seeing a greater surroundings. Because I'll tell you, even weeds can make you feel alive. They are so tenacious. You know, especially in Ohio, growing up, we had all these dandelions. And they were beautiful, and people made wine out of them. And yet they were weeds. And so there's all this juiciness going on around us if we're not too lazy to see it. So one of the books I pulled off my uh, bookshelf was by Pema Chodron. She's an author, but she's also a Buddhist nun. Great writer, great writer. And the book is entitled No Time to Lose. It's kind of how I feel. There's no time to lose. How much more can I learn before, you know, we're on the downside and someday and, you know, I won't be here to keep learning, and I love to learn. Well, her teacher was Trungpa Rinpoche, and he encouraged all his students to experiment with life. Don't do it like I did. Experiment, because you've got nothing to lose. Now, we don't say, want to say that to teenagers because they experiment anyway, and they do it in ways that just give us great anxiety. But if we took Rinpoche's idea you know, they've got a life, lot of life left in them. Experiment and come back, experiment and come back. But that puts a lot of trust on our part. We have to trust a lot in the intelligence, in the intelligent wisdom inherent in every human being. 
Well, one thing he said is, if no wind blows, then nothing stirs. And I like that thought. If the wind isn't blowing, nothing stirs. As I watch my neighbor's leaves, thousands of them come down on our deck. The wind is blowing and it's stirring and Paul, you know, the deck's a mess. And then I come to work here and I bless him and I'm grateful for all the work he does at home. Anyway, that, that's a real an aside on this topic because he is another person that's not lazy. If he's not doing something, he's not happy either. So Rinpoche defined three different ways of being lazy, and you might recognize some of this. One is not willing to be put any effort towards life. Not willing to put any effort towards life. Why? Because you become too comfortable. Anyone like comfort? I love comfort. But, you know, comfort has a downside. It can become addictive. And it becomes so addictive that we avoid life's challenges or what he calls unpleasant trees, like a colonoscopy or something. You know, those, how many people have avoided that? I mean, really. And so when I was young, many of my neighbors would take trips and they would go to London or Paris and they'd stay in a Holiday Inn. I was always in awe of that because the Holiday Inn in our town of Springfield, Ohio was no great shakes, you know. It was just this little place. And they would go halfway around the world and stay in a Holiday Inn. So I was always amazed at that. But what did they want? Guaranteed comfort, a bed that worked, food that didn't make you sick. They wanted comfort. They wanted to know that they were going to be comfortable. They didn't want any surprises. You know, when we become too comfortable, we forget about our dreams. Oh, yeah, I had that dream. Probably wouldn't work right now. Well, I'll never be out of debt. It's just the way it is, and I'm comfortable with it. Well, our philosophy invites you to don't go a step further. If you have p pitched your tent in a level of comfort, we're asking you to pick up that tent, pick up those stakes, and go further. Go further. And it may feel scary, but it's Halloween. You know, it's supposed to feel scary. <laughs> So it's fine. It's Halloween, but you know behind the mask of all those beautiful kids that came to our house the other night are just little angels, just incredible little angels. So if you're feeling too comfortable, I invite you to sign up for classes. That's where you'll learn what it means to move forward, what it means to grow in your intellect, but also grow in all different ways, whether it's your body, your finances, whatever. That's where we teach growth. That's where we teach it, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. Ask someone taking my troward class this week. This is difficult. No, it's just learning to think how troward thinks. And she still doesn't like it, but she comes. And I have to give her a lot of credit because it takes courage. It takes courage to unwind what he's saying, the wisdom of what he's saying, and the building blocks he's putting together so that you honestly, at the end of the book, can go, I know how this works. I understand the universe, and I know how it works. And you feel fearless. It gives you a sense of fearlessness. So sometimes we do tend to lose our enthusiasm about life because of the past. Oh, the past is holding us back. Well, we didn't meet the right person in our life, so eh, I'm only 40, but it's over. <laughs> I know people like that. I do, I do. So we get stuck where we are. We just get stuck. And we don't know how to move forward. You know, I remember in college, um, I went three years around, three years every day to college just to get it done because I didn't feel like a party gal. Although I had to party a lot because it was so stressful. But <laughs> <laughs> it was very stressful. But I probably mentioned before that when I went to college, I, I was determined to get a 3.0. And at the end of three years, I looked at my grades and I started to laugh because I had a 3.01. Because that's what was in my consciousness. But I was reading Joel Olstein's new book, Breakout. Joel is a mega church minister. He has a church that has 16,000 seats in it, and he fills them every Sunday. He's just an amazing guy. Now, he believes God is out there. So I, I take that, and I understand that, but we believe as creations of the one, it's all in here also, and the wisdom comes from in here. But he has this great story he talked about, a university professor 
who was coming up on the final exam for his class, and it was quite a difficult class. And on that day, he said to his students, anyone who wants a C, just raise your hand, and then you could leave, and I will give you a C. And one by one, I know, if it was my chemistry class, I'd have been there, but I don't know what class this was. One by one, people are raising their hands, and finally half the class had their hand raised, and he wrote down their names, and he said, go and have a good summer. And they were so relieved. I can imagine that feeling. So he passed out the test to all the other students. He said, keep it covered. I don't turn it over yet. Because what I want to tell you is that when you strive for a better grade, when you strive for a better grade in life, you're going to get it. He said, now you can turn your paper over. And at the top it said, congratulations, you've got an A. <laughs> now that's a teacher. If anyone offers you that deal, don't take the C. Don't take the C. So the question is, are you doing a C, C grade life when God's got an A for you? Now Joel says God's got an A for you and he's breathing on your neck to help you move forward in life. I don't see it, but it feels kind of good, God's breath on my neck. But the point is, are you moving with what you inherently know to be the truth about you? Because many times we settle for a C because the A is too challenging. But we have to want an A. We have to want it. I wanted that three points so bad. Some of those teachers' associates saw me two and three times a week to get through chemistry. And I made it. So I had to want it. I had to want it deeply. So what we say around here is you want an A grade life? Do your spiritual practices. Do them. That's where the courage comes from. That's where the fearlessness builds and builds and builds. I saw this cartoon re recently, and it was Reasons Not to Meditate, which is a spiritual practice, by the way. The first little square was a little baby that said, too young, reasons not to meditate. Then there were students and parents, and everybody was real busy, and it said, too busy. Then the next box, there was an elderly person, and it said, too old. And then there was a casket, and it said, too late. <laughs> too late. Don't make it too late, please. Do your spiritual practices. That's where you're going to get an A life, an A life. It's worth working for. We don't have to just settle for good enough. And you know what that means, where that place is in your life. So the, the adage, change your thinking, change your life, is really true. That's where we get the wisdom, by changing our thinking. We may not have it immediately, but it will help propel us in the right direction. So the Rinpoche defines the second type of laziness as loss of heart, where we try and try and try. We try and try and try. I'm trying. Do you know what that means in a spiritual mind treatment? You're never going to get there. You're never going to get there. You're just trying. I'm trying. I'm efforting. I'm efforting. I'm efforting. So we do get lazy, and then when we do get lazy, we do all these trivial things to just make sure we're busy being alive. The, all these things that don't get us where we want to go. And what that causes is depression, because we're trying, efforting, trying, efforting, and we get wrapped up in, now Paul would think, my trivial thing is the computer. I love Google, I love my computer, but I'm always doing research or I'm writing something, so it's a tool. But I know there are probably millions of people that use it as a trivial pursuit to follow other people's A lives. <laughs> <laughs> and I see that, and it's, that can be depressing. <laughs> it can be depressing when we're more invested in other people's lives than we are our own. The truth is that Spirit God meets us at our level of faith, where we are in our faith. If we have an A-rated faith, we get some juicy A-rated experiences. So it's, it's, it, it's a reflection of where we are. And so when I teach people how to do spiritual mind treatment, our form of affirmative prayer, I like to pass out power words to help them juice it up. Juice it up. 
And what Joel calls, calls a, a God-sized prayer is yours a God-sized prayer. Because that's big. That's as big as the universe. A God-sized prayer. No little wishy-washy prayer. Because spirit responds to that. You want to do a wishy-washy prayer, you get kind of a wishy-washy experience. Or you take potluck. In the Bible, in James, it says, you have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. That's so true in Science of Mind. Are you shortchanging yourself from an A-rated life? We may not have the talent. We may not have all the pieces of the pie. But that doesn't matter because in the universe, all great things are already there in the mind of God. They're already there. So recently, I wanted to share it. I wrote an affirmative prayer for someone who was having eye problems. It was a full page long. I took Joel's advice. I wrote a God-sized prayer. <laughs> it was pretty long, but it was pretty good. I wanted to share just a part of you, this with you to see if you can recognize the, the power, the energy, the aliveness in this. From this moment forward, I know that she pays greater attention to herself as an individual creation of God. I focus on the health of her eyes, which were created by God, to enjoy the beauty of the earth, the flowers, the plants, the sun, and the clouds. As she fills her mind with beauty, her body feels enlivened, refreshed, and her eyes return to perfect health. She feels lighter, full of satisfaction, energetic and clear. With her body alive and healthy, I know her mind is clear and sharp, enabling her to see a greater plan, a greater good that God has available to her right now that leads to seeing greater beauty flowing in her life. As she takes the helm of her life, and with perfect sight, she now steers easily through all currents, delighting in the waves and the wildlife. God charts the course, and she steers with courageous abandon. Do you feel that energy? That's a God-sized prayer. It's not, I'm going to get used to this, and it's going to be okay. Uh, not in this teaching. Not in this teaching. But we have to ask for it, you know. We have to believe that we, it can be. And that's what our ministers and practitioners do for you, help you see that. The next kind of laziness is the I couldn't care less laziness. It's kind of a despondency. Ever hear a teenager say, I couldn't care less? You, know, you really feel better if you do empty the trash. I couldn't care less. You really, really will feel better if you don't watch as much TV. Couldn't care less. This really good... Uh, Nova program would be good for you to watch. Couldn't care less. But it's our nature to be curious. You know, little kids don't come out of the womb and when they're two years old say, I couldn't care less about walking. I could care less about good food, a treat, seeing mom. I couldn't care less. It's not natural. We have a natural curiosity that's inherent in us. And if there's any area of your life where you say, I couldn't care less, I invite you to take a good look at that. We were created to be curious. Uh, curiosity is a state of mind. Pema Chodron suggests, why not try enthusiasm? Why not? Years ago, I worked at Crown Zeller back, and this one fellow was so enthusiastic, and he was on my team one time, and he would not do a stick of work, nothing. But he was enthusiastic. And he was so frustrating because he was like a cheerleader. Every time we had a meeting, yay, we're going to get this project done. And he did nothing. <laughs> Finally, I took him aside. I said, this is driving me crazy. You aren't helping. He says, I'm enthusiastic. No one got fired for enthusiasm. No one ever did. That was his belief. And he may still be there. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> enthusiasm is an interesting thing. Monday, I went to a memorial service in Chico at the Greater Chico Church Center for Spiritual Living. And their minister had died, Reverend Louis Gates. And Louis was enthusiasm personified. I mean, the guy was an energy, energizer bunny that never stopped. His parents said he didn't talk till he was three years old because he had other brothers and sisters and they always talked for him. But when he was three, he cut loose and he never stopped. He never stopped. He wanted to know not only who you were, where you lived, what color you liked, who your grandmother was, where you went to school. He knew, he wanted to know everything about everybody. 
His life was bigger than life. He and his partner, Michael, had a beauty salon there in Chico for 32 years. And when you walked in there, the energy just hit you. And he always had an extra half hour after your appointment so he could dig into your life and find out where it was juicy. Always. He was an incredible man. And he died like that. They were getting ready to go to a funeral and do the funeral, and he fell down, and that was it. Now, may we all be that blessed. But it was a shock to the whole community. It was a big shock. So they expected, they had to move it to this other facility, and they expected 300 people, and 800 showed up. That's how loved he was. Bigger than life. Enthusiasm. So if he gave me nothing else, it's am I being enthusiastic about life today? Am I being enthusiastic about being in your presence? What a gift. If you catch yourself hanging around with someone who drowns your enthusiasm, <laughs> take a step back and look at the experience from God's eyes. Because the love of God is the pulse in the universe. That's what's always coming to us is love, and we're not always open to feeling it or sharing it. But when we find ourselves with people who want to drown that, it's important to take a step back. Another thing to do is to tame our mind. This is another uh, Pema Chodron idea. To increase aliveness is to tame our mind. The more we let go of judgment, there's more room for happiness. The more we let go of sadness, the more room there is for happiness. To see a rose, to see a dandelion, to see a cloud, to see the rain. Paul thinks I'm nuts, but I listen to a lot of news. I read several newspapers, magazines, listen to the radio. I'm into the news. And I go through four or five news things on the computer every morning because I want to know what's happening. And everybody's got a different take on it. So I'm trying to figure out what, what's really happening here. And I asked myself a lot about that this week because I thought, is it making me more alive or more depressed? And it can be very depressing. But Emma Curtis Hopkins had the answer. She was one of the people that Ernest Holmes studied with before he went on his own way. And she said, every person at every moment of every day is doing exactly what they think is in their best interest, no matter how it looks, no matter how ugly it looks in the news. Everyone is doing what's in their best interest. Now, we could give them a lot of advice, but they all think they're right. They all do. So I try and stand back, and, and I'm going, okay, God, this is starting to make me a little ticked off. How do I see it from God's eyes? How do I see that they're not problem solving or they are problem solving? Holy cow, look at the solution. And you know, you, you can get all caught up in that. But if we go to the intent that everyone is at of doing what's in their best interest, the sky is not falling. In the 20s, the sky was falling. In the 40s, the sky was falling. Today, the sky is falling, but I'm here to tell you it's not because everyone's doing what's in their best interest. And as we pour more love into the universe, more of that is going to ex be experienced, and that's going to change everyone's opinion and reflection about what they're doing. So I totally trust the universe on this one. I totally trust God. I totally trust the evolution of the soul. It looks pretty weird at times, but I trust it. So I can smile, and I can sleep well at night even if I watch all the news that there is. I know it's a little nuts, but it's true. It's true. Pema says, look for the gaps. When there's a cloud overhead, punch holes in the cloud. Look for, look for the gaps. Create gaps. Because we know whenever there's a cloud, the sun is still shining. You ever have that day when it's so dark and cloudy, and then there's this little blue speck up there? You go, it's, the sun is still shining. Thank goodness. And when the clouds part, it's still beautiful. So she says, punch holes in those clouds. Do it with your mind. Do it with your mind. Trust in the nature of the universe. When I was in chaplain training, I really learned this, and I didn't realize it until I was reflecting on it. Because every time I was with somebody in the ER and that person died, 
and their family came, I realized the first three sentences that I said they would repeat to all the rest of the members of their family. And it's just a thing because they're in such shock, they grab onto everything that they hear and the, the mind says it must be true. So what I had to do as a chaplain is step back and say this is a pretty big cloud for some of these families. So what am I going to say? How am I going to punch a hole in that cloud and give them something to share with each other that is true but is comforting, that gives them some level of comfort? And that's what we can all do in times of stress when we're really stressed. It helps us live life fearlessly. And that's a good feeling. Not only do I feel alive, but I feel fearless because I'm stepping back at every moment. And so I invite you to think about this as you breathe. When we breathe, we take a breath in and a breath out. And there's a pause. Do that with me. Breath in, breath out. There's a little pause, isn't there? Just a little pause. That's where you punch the holes in the darkness. That's where you punch the holes in the cloud, in that pause moment. It's just that moment when the wind is in our sails, when, when we tap into the truth about each one of us. And so I encourage you the next time you have a challenge, breathe, but in the pause, think of, okay, how can I fill this with some truth, with, with some words of wisdom, not only for myself, but for all those around us. And, you know, I have to confess, Ministers and practitioners fall off the wagon. And when we do, we don't go in a corner and beat ourselves up. We laugh. We go, I'll be darned, I did that? Boy, what wasn't I thinking? <laughs> and we laugh about it. Because we can all still pick ourselves back up and move forward. Say, I'm sorry if we have to. Laugh at the situation. Have people laugh with us. I'll be darned, we're all human. It's a great feeling. So I encourage you to be radical today. Radically enthusiastic. Think of the best treat you can give yourself. Chocolate chip ice cream. Maybe it's a donut. I don't care what it is, but give yourself a treat. Make it an A day. Just let your body be alive with, with that that's already inherent in you. Just be a little radical. Eat ice cream. Take a walk. But most importantly, be grateful to be alive as a child of God. So I want to read this little thing from Science of Mind, Living the Science of Mind. I think it's just cute as it can be, if I can find it. Let the howlers howl, and the growlers growl, and the scowlers scowl, and let the tough get going at it. For behind the night, there's plenty of light. And the world's all right, and I know it. And so it is. <laughs>